So we're in this series called Uncommon Influencers. And the idea behind this series is pretty simple. It, it jumps off of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks to his disciples, and he's, he describes them in two different ways. He says, you are to be salt, and you are to be light. You are to be salt, and you are to be light. And you are to do good works, and people will see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. And so the idea behind that, with salt and with light, is they influence everything that they touch. They influence everything that they touch. And what we believe is that, well, I'd say this, what I believe is that right now on planet earth, what God is doing is a preparatory work with his people. I truly believe that God is doing a preparatory work in his people because I think for too long the people of God have not been people of influence. Or they have been people of influence, but they've been perhaps the wrong type of influence. In fact, today, this entire sermon is simply about this one idea, influence, influence. And here's why I want to talk about this. Because for many of you, as I say, uncommon influencers, uncommon influencers, what I mean by that are people who are not influencing the world by how impressive they are, but how they serve the world around them. But when we think about influencers, many of us would have the idea, like, I am not an influencer, like I'm a super normal person. And, and you might, you know, think you're like better than normal, but the truth is you're probably pretty normal. Right, like everybody thinks that they're like the exception. Oh, I'm going to do a bunch of cool stuff. I mean, it's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be extraordinary. Um, and for those of you who kind of, you know, you think that, you just need to know the vast majority of people who have ever existed on planet Earth, we no longer remember. But God has called you to be a person of influence. On the other side of that, um, <clears throat> there's some of us who we think a person of influence <clears throat> Like, I'm trying to get a job right now, not have, like, influence, not have, like, oh, my gosh, I am influencing the city for the kingdom of God. I am, you know, I'm, I'm going for it, and I'm just influencing. People are influenced by me. I am uncommon in my ability, in the span, in the scope of my influence. You're thinking, do you know anybody who's hiring because I'm thinking about going back to grad school now, because honestly, I just graduated, and I don't even have a job. And to think about doing something of significance with influence can be very difficult. And, and, and let me kind of break down this paradigm of what we think about when we think about influence. When most of us think about influence, we think about one of two different things. Positional influence or opinion-based influence. Positional influence or opinion-based influence. In fact, when you think of people who you perhaps think of as people who are influencers, most of them fall into one of those two categories. They either have a position of influence, which means they have a title, they're the boss, um, they're the ones who are the direct reports when you go to work, they're the people who are in charge of like the government, whether it's on the state, whether it's on a city, whether it's on a you know, federal, national level. They are the people who have a position of influence. Or it's the people who have the strongest opinion. It's the people who oftentimes have the most polarizing opinion. You know, this kind of like middle of the road thought process gets very little airtime because it's honestly not that like alluring and sexy, right? You see like a headline that's just like outrageous, you're like, oh, that's outrageous. I'm gonna click on that. Some of you are like, that's outrageous. I'm clicking on it because I agree. Some of you are like, that's outrageous. I'm gonna click on that because I disagree. They're like, we don't care. You clicked on it, right? But there's this opinion based influence and there's this positional influence. But here's what I would argue neither of those are influence. Neither of those are influence. Positional influence is authority, not influence. And opinion-based influence is attention and not influence. You can have all the authority in the world, and you can have all the attention in the world. But just because you have authority or you have attention, as soon as you lose either one of those, you lose pull in my life, or they lose pull in your life. Now, isn't that true? Let's just take the positional influence. You have a boss, or you've had a boss, and that boss has been such an extraordinary leader. 
that for some reason, the way that they, you know, you, they direct reported and you had the meeting and they called you in and they just kind of said some stuff and you had some conversations, that you've had a boss that whether or not they, would, they were your boss, they still had influence in your life. But you've also had a boss who the moment that they walked out of the room, the moment that you left that job, you thought that person will never tell me what to do again. Isn't that interesting? When I say influence, I mean lasting, sustaining influence. And what I want to talk about today is how I think every single person can have influence. No matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what your level of education, if you are, you know, 16 listening and you're just in school and you're like me, you're like, you're in school, but you're not like good at school. You're like super subpar at school. And you're thinking, man, <clears throat> I think if I graduate high school, TCC, Tallahassee Community College has to take me. Or for some of you, you know, you, you're, you're much further along in life and you would have positional perhaps influence. That no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter where you're from, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your education, you can have influence and not in this big pastoral hypothetical bombastic you know you you can have influence under the power of God that, that that's true but it's actually really really simple so let me give you the the equation for influence your action not your position or your opinion ultimately determines your influence your actions, not your position or your opinions, ultimately determine your influence. Now, who we're going to read about today, and the story we're dropping into is Nehemiah. In the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel had been exiled into Babylon and Babylon and the Babylonian exile. Persia became the world superpower. There was a couple of different decrees that people said Cyrus first said, you know, if you have been exported in the Babylonian, you know, kind of empire, then you can go back to your home. And then a little bit later on, King Artaxerxes said, okay, now Nehemiah, I know that you have heard that the walls are in ruins. And so Nehemiah, you can go home and you can build the wall around your city. Nehemiah had clapped with the king. He was the cupbearer to the king, which meant that every time the, the king ate or drank something, Nehemiah would taste it first. So there was a lot of trust there. But Nehemiah basically asked a king to fund and give him paid time off to build the walls, which walls were the military fortress around the city. It was the first line of defense for the military for a city who had been historically rebellious against any king who wasn't Jewish or of the nation of Israel at that time. And so Nehemiah is a man of great influence. What we're going to see is that Nehemiah, as he travels back to the city, is a person of great influence because he was a person of great action and a specific type of action at that. If you've got your Bible, you can open it up. If you've got your phone, you can open your app, however it is that you get down with all that stuff. So Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 7. We read a little bit of this last week, but this is Nehemiah's tail end of the conversation with the king to kind of get us going into the text this morning. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let the letters be given to me, let the letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter of Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. In other words, king, I want you to give me time off. I want you to let me go. And I actually want you to give me a letter so that you can fund it, king, we're on a building campaign right now. Our building campaign is a wall campaign. And later on, a my house campaign. And king, I would like you to pay for it. And so this is what the king says. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. And then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me of the army, officers of the army and the horsemen. But we introduced the two new characters. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Amorite servant, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people 
of Israel. Now, a couple things to pay attention to in what we just read. Number one is this. We think, or when we read the Bible, we lose kind of the geographical um, context to what's happening here. So Nehemiah in chapter 1 was in Susa, and chapter 2 travels to Jerusalem. We're thinking like, yeah, okay, so he was in Tallahassee, and he just decided to go down to Wakulla. He heard that Perry's having a big mud bog this weekend, so he's going over there. You know, he heard something cool is happening up Atlanta, and so he just kind of went up to Atlanta. It was a four-hour drive. It was a little bit inconvenient. But this was for Nehemiah. He's traveling. He's got a crew of people with him, what we're going to find out. And this was somewhere between 900 to 1,000 miles that Nehemiah traveled. This took him approximately, best, best we can guess, based on some of the, the date markers that happened in this book. This took him somewhere around the neighborhood of four months to travel. You see, Nehemiah talks to the king. Nehemiah has spent months in prayer before this, fasting, praying, fasting, praying. I have this burden, I have this burden, I have this burden, I have this burden. He has an opportunity that praying, that fasting, that praying, that fasting over time develops both a patience in him and also a sense of opportunistic dependency on God. So he sees this window, talks to the king, the king says yes, and all of a sudden Nehemiah springs into action. Nehemiah then travels hundreds of miles, over months at a time. I want you to see what Nehemiah says in that too. Because Nehemiah, as he's kind of, you know, looking at the spectrum of things that are going on, he travels and he travels and he travels and he comes to these governors and as the governors are talking to him, it says the governors were opposed to him because Nehemiah was seeking the welfare of the city. I'm going to read the rest of what we're, a, a big chunk of what we're going to read today. And I want you to see all of the actions that Nehemiah takes. First is Nehemiah decides, I'm going to travel. That's the first action I'm going to take. It's going to be for the benefit and the welfare of the other people. Verse 11, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. So three days, he doesn't really tell anybody. He says, then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me. So he's kind of like a late nighter, early riser. I tend to think that he's a late nighter because I like to be a late nighter a little bit more than an early riser. He says, then I arose at night. I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There are so many leadership lessons that we're just going to skip over. One of the things, just as like a little like flyby idea, is a great leader knows when to speak and knows when to listen. Knows when to cast vision and when, knows when to be silent. Knows when to plan and when to announce. So Nehemiah goes out by night. Since I rose at night, a few men with me told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one which I rode. I went out by night by the valley. So I went out. I got up. I traveled thousands of miles or hundreds of miles. I went out by night to the gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate into the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under the, under the pass. And then I went in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work, and then I said to them. Here's what's fascinating about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not afraid of hard work. Nehemiah is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Nehemiah is not afraid of action. You see, here's what I find. We want to influence people because of perhaps our opinion, perhaps our position, but for more so for the common folks like us, because of our intentions. We hope to do well. We hope it goes over well. We hope someone do, does something, and we're going to pray for them, and we're going to think about them, and we're going to hope for the best. And we have the best intentions as Christians. Yet we have very little action behind what we do. And don't get me wrong, prayer is absolutely an action. But very rarely... Does our action end in prayer? Prayer is usually the RSVP that gets us a table at the restaurant. Think about that. We love to intend good, but rarely do good. 
In fact, if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, isn't this kind of the problem? I mean, if you were to kind of boil down your experience with Christians and why Christianity is difficult for you and why you're just not sure, isn't this true? That part of the reason why you don't like God, Jesus, faith is you have heard people with opinions and intentions, but very few of them that actually had action. You heard Christians that talked about a traditional view or a biblical view or a conservative view or just a view of marriage that divorce is bad and that marriage is between a man and a woman. And here's what you saw, though they said that and though they believed that, what you saw is a divorce rate that mirrored everybody else in the world. What you heard is that God so loved the world and Christians are supposed to love people. But you interacted with people who were Christians who were the most unloving people. You experienced some Christians who were supposed to not just be not judgmental. They were supposed to be generous. And then you met the most stingy, self-focused, self-righteous view and experience with Christians. We have great intentions. And we oftentimes even have good opinions. But we got to ask the question, does our actions, do our actions, does our life validate, substantiate, and stand behind the things that we think and that we believe? Because I feel like most of the world is just like, <laughs> you're a liar. You see, my fear is that we live in an age, we live in an age where we are not even aware of how much we are influenced by the age around us, by the world around us. Isn't this true? More of us, more of us spend time thinking about, debating about things on social media than we do actually loving and serving our neighbor. Isn't this true? Most of us spend more time, more thought capital, mental capital, emotional capital, thinking about how we disagree with the other side than actively worrying about, praying about, and loving our neighbor and praying for the people who are in charge. Let me ask you this. Just like, not even, not even what you do publicly, internally, do you spend more time complaining or praying? You see, the people of God are supposed to be a people who have this, this depth of belief, and this depth of belief drives them to action. And Nehemiah was never afraid. In fact, he thought, and the way he acted, and the way he lived was that actions, 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 as he was dependent on God, as he was continually prayerful to God, his life substantiated who he was, what he was, because of his actions. And his actions, by the way, what was interesting, we're going to find out, was not about himself. You keep, for many of us, the reason that we want to act and do what we do is not simply because we care about other people, it's because we care about how other people view us. One of the things that was really difficult and kind of, you know, confounding it was when everything was happening, you know, with uh, the, in the initial wake, and there's still a lot of phenomenal uh, wake that's happening in the, in, the light, in, in light of what happened with um, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, was that, was that it seemed like at some point, let me just talk about pastors for a second, at some point it seemed like there was this need as, as a white pastor to say something not because I cared, but because I didn't want to be the only white pastor who didn't say something. It was image management. And that's like the conversation right now, right? Is do I care beyond two weeks ago? This is why we launched the whole 3 2, one campaign, because this is so important. The needs in our city are so important. The needs in the communities, the, the, the transition of power that needs to exist, where we are empowering, where we feel like, for some of us, for many of us, we were born and given positions of power. And in that power, we need to take our power and give it away to empower other people. You see, here's what happens with Nehemiah. Nehemiah's actions were not about himself. Nehemiah's actions were always to serve other people and to add value to them. Listen to this. Here's Nehemiah's sermon as he gets everybody together. Then I said to them, now 
to connect 17 to verse 16. Verse 16, he says, the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. So he gets, he has a big crowd around him. And this is what I said to them. You see the trouble we are in, felt deed. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. You see how this looks. You see how, I mean, we're just, we, we ought to just be ashamed of ourselves because we see how poor and how pitiful and how, how much we should be doing more, but we're not doing more. You see the level of almost humiliation that we live in because of this. He didn't say you. He says we. Not your fault. This is us. He says, so come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them, verse 18, of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also that the words that the king had spoken to me, and they said, let us rise up and build. So they straighten their hands for the good work. You see, Nehemiah's actions were actions that added value to other people. His actions weren't just to say, look at me, I am so extraordinarily good and self-righteous. He says, no, 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 let's get to work helping people. Let's get to work adding value to people. Now, here's what's interesting to me about this, is that when you think about, when I think about the people who have added the most value in my life, they have also been almost exclusively the people who influence me the most. The people who are the most influential also added the most value to my life. The people who I would look at and say, I am so thankful that that person was in my life. Was it because of an opinion that they had or some authority that they had? It's because they actually served in a way, loved in a way, lived in a way where oftentimes it selflessly added value to me. Here's what you need to know. Here's the entire sermon summarized. You gain influence when your actions add value to people. You gain influence when your actions add value to people. You see, actions that add value influence people. So Nehemiah has done all this work. He's done all the research. He spent months in prayer, traveled hundreds of miles over months on end. He's gotten up at night. He's inspected. He's planned. He's got the whole thing bankrolled. And he says, by the way, my God is behind me and the king is behind me. So people, I'm not going to use that to develop and to build up myself and say, yeah, you're right. Nehemiah is here. Have you seen your boy? See, Nehemiah waited three days. He waited three days. He could have done anything, but he said, no, 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 I'm not going to announce it. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just kind of going to be this weirdo. Now, this must have been weird because Nehemiah also came in with a ton of timber. He came in with some of the king's army. People are probably like, who is this dude? Who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah could have leveraged this for himself, but Nehemiah chose instead to add value to the people and to the world around him. You see, if you've been hurt by the church, if you've been burned by Christians, isn't it true that most likely the reason is, is because at some point there was someone in your life who did the opposite. They didn't add value, they hurt you. They didn't come to serve, they came to expect something from you. You see, let me be crystal clear about where we get all of this from. The idea that we influence by adding value, we influence by adding value, that we gain influence as I add value to people around me and to the world around me and to the city around me every single day. It comes from Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be leveraged, but instead made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He was the one who said, 
for even the Son of Man, for even the eternal God in bodily form, even God in his utmost, God in his highest, God, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus. He said, even I, even I, I could have, I could have pulled the God card, I could have used my authority, I could have used my opinion, but I did neither. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to live a life and to live in such a way that I would give my life as a ransom for many. You want to gain influence, you serve. You want to gain influence, you die to yourself and you add value to everybody around you. If you're looking for what's the starting point for this, wake up every day for the next week and simply add this question, ask this question, how can I add value to people around me today? How can I add value to one person around me today? That value might be that you added value not in some crazy, big, incredible, dynamic, wild, extraordinary act, but you simply sent a text to someone that you know is hurting saying, hey, I know you're going through right now, and I just want you to know I love you. I'm praying for me. Please let me know if there's anything I can do for you. You see, we love to see this, these gigantic versions. But isn't this true? That the people around you who have gained the most influence with you, it was rarely this gigantic thing that they did, and it was almost always consistent deposits, consistent deposits, consistent deposits of adding value and adding value and adding value and adding value and adding value, and adding value to you. That over time, they became some of the most influential people in your life. This is why some parents are great parents and some parents aren't. Because some parents consistently add value to their kids, and hopefully we do that. But if your parent wasn't that great, isn't that kind of the problem? Is that you just don't feel like, and you're thankful for some stuff that they did, and it was good, and you're sure that they sacrificed, but it just seemed like they said they cared. But there was no real action. Because we value and we are influenced by people who value and add value to us. And the reason we as Christians add value to the people around us is not because the people around us deserve it. It's not because the people around us align with us. It's because the people around us are people who Jesus died for. He did not create boundaries or parameters or confines with which he would determine who would and who would not be loved and served by him. And he also didn't create clear boundaries and parameters around what that meant. Sometimes to serve somebody means that you send them a the nice text. And sometimes to serve somebody and to add value to them means, hey, I've seen some stuff and we need to have a really difficult conversation. I don't want to have this, but I love you too much not to. For some of you, you see a parent that's struggling. And the best thing that you can do is just simply say, how can I serve you? For some of you, you see a roommate that's struggling. Maybe someone who, because of everything that's going on, they live with you or around you, and you know they're going through this depressive state right now. And the best way that you can add value and serve them is just simply to be with them. Not say anything. <laughs> Not God got a plan. Yes, he does but perhaps they just need to know that God's present through you. So here's the question. If we want to be uncommon influencers, people who influence the city for the kingdom by meeting the practical needs to spiritual ends and bringing the gospel as such, we have to begin with the mindset that our actions in adding value determines our influence. Our actions... And how we add value through our actions determines our influence. And don't you dare think that the people with the biggest and the most polarizing and bombastic opinions or in the highest places of authority and positionally have influence. They have authority and they have attention. And neither of those are influence. Here's my prayer. Right now, 
there are some things that we can do practically to love and serve the people around us. But because of social distancing, because of the way that, you know, we just have to be smart and have to be wise, for many of us, this is the burden that God's putting on our heart that we feel like, I don't know what I can do with this. I don't know how I can act on this because of the fact that it just seems like there's nothing, there's nothing normal about what has been normal. I can't say this enough. I think this entire series is a preparatory series in the life of the people of God and specifically in the life of our church. Because I think God has called us to be a people of influence, but we influence not because of who we are, but how we serve. We influence because we add value and because we serve the people around us, not because we are so incredible and cool and God has done cool things. So let me finish with this last question one more time. How could you add value to the people around you today? How can you add value to the people around you today? How can you add value every single day? And how can you build into the rhythm of your schedule that as you look back on your day, you can ask this question, did I add value today? Did I add value today? Did I add value to the people and to the world around me? And if you can say that consistently as a yes, 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 here's what you will find. Over days and weeks and months and years, you will become a person of extraordinary influence. The most influential people in our church are the people who added the most value to the people in our church. The people who are the most influential in our city are the people who have added the most value to the people in our city. I hope and I pray God builds us into a people of extraordinary influence because we are committed to adding people, to adding value to people around us because Jesus once looked at us, God looked at us, God still looks at us and says, I love you so much that though you don't deserve it, I'm going to send my son to sacrifice and die for you. Our actions and adding value not our position or our opinion, ultimately develops influence in our city. Let's pray together. Jesus, we know that Christians, we have consistently been bad at this. We have consistently underperformed in that area, and God, we repent of that. We repent of the fact that we have led with our opinions to the dismissal of our actions and thought that our opinions projected were substantive enough that we didn't need action behind it and people wouldn't even notice. But you notice, you see us, you see our hearts. I pray that you would give us the heart of Nehemiah who looked at the city around him, heard, it broke his heart, he was dependent on you, he was prayerful to you, and then he had the actions to add value to the city, the Jerusalem, the people of God in the city. I pray that you would make us people who aren't afraid of hard work, aren't afraid of sacrifice, aren't afraid to get our hands dirty. That if you say go, we will travel thousands of miles. If you say go, we will get up in the middle of the night and inspect. Though we have all the things and the tools and the resources perhaps behind us, you would give us the humility to simply ask, with what I have, how can I add value today? What is currently in my hands that I can love and serve the people around me. That influence is developed as we add value to the people around us. And I pray that in that, as we add value to the people around us, people would see what we do and not praise us, but turn and praise you, our Father in heaven. Because all of this is simply a reflection of Jesus, what you did for us. When you served us in the ultimate way that you died for us on a cross. And so God, I ask that you would help each one of us to simply ask the question, how can I add value to the people and the world around me today? And that you would make us uncommon influencers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.